This is Charles Prober. And I'm Morgan Thies. And we're going to talk about the prevention of tuberculosis. And there are eyes, four eyes to consider in preventing TB infections. Uh, one eye stands for intensified case finding. We'll come back to that, but uh, finding cases of TB. When we talk about that, we'll talk about finding cases of latent TB and what we can do about it, and finding cases of active infection and what we can do about it. Okay. The second of the four I's is isoniazid, or INH, an important anti-tuberculous drug that in the context of this video, we're going to talk about its use in the treatment of latent TB. Okay. The third I is isolation, and that uh, we're going to talk about in the context of an actively infected patient, an infect a patient that may be infectious to others, and how we can prevent the spread of their TB to other people. So this is like a very good infectious disease principle, right? Pretty much it, with any infection, you want to isolate the person from spreading it. For many, that is absolutely true. And then the fourth I is immunization. Oh, okay. What vaccine we currently have available for the prevention of TB and perhaps what's on the horizon. Okay. So starting with the first I, intensified case finding. So mentioned at the onset that we're either looking for latently infected people, people with a positive TB skin test, for example, or looking for cases of active TB. Well, first of all, thinking about those who uh, may be latently infected with TB or actively infected, there are certain high-risk populations that we always have to keep in mind. Uh, for example, uh, persons immigrating, moving from a country that's got a high level of infection with TB, such as in many of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, moving to another part of the world that has a low level of TB infection, such as North America, the mm -hmm. United States, or Canada. Another high-risk population, uh, similar, are migrant workers from highly endemic areas. Another high-risk population are prisoners, especially in the United States. The homeless population have a high risk of tuberculosis. Individuals who abuse drugs intravenously, IVDU, intravenous drug using individuals, have a high risk of TB. And those co-infected or infected with HIV have a high risk. So these would be individuals that we would be screening with uh, tuberculin skin tests, for example, on a regular basis. And if we find them to be positive on that test, that is to be latently infected with TB, this leads us to the second eye, which is INH. Um, treating these latently infected individuals with isoniazid is a very effective way of reducing the likelihood that the latent infection will become an active infection. INH is about 90% effective in reducing infection. The prescription of INH is for a 9 to 12 month period. Um, it is a long time, that's correct. Uh, but with that 9 to 12 months of treatment, you reduce infection developing. There are some alternatives to INH alone, but the alternatives tend to be a little bit more toxic, have more side effects. But uh, one example of an alternative is to give INH with rifampin for four months, um, or, ion, or rifampin with pyrazinamide, PZA, uh, for two to three months. And these combined therapies seem to be almost as effective as INH alone for nine to 12 months, but not quite, and they also are more toxic. Okay. So again, the second I is INH. Now, it, once you start treating someone who has latent TB with INH, how long before they stop being infectious? Well, they're not infectious to begin with. So if oh. they have latent TB, they're not infectious. The idea of treating them is so that they don't develop active TB. Which would be infectious. Which would be infectious. Okay. And in fact, let's stay with this intensive case finding and go down the active TB pathway. Mm -hmm. So many persons with active TB are infectious for other individuals. 
There are some that are much more infectious than others. For example, if you've got pulmonary TB, the most uh, common site of infection with TB, and that pulmonary TB is cavitary, so there's a big cavity on the chest x-ray, the likelihood is that that's teeming with uh, TB organisms. Uh, that is, there's a lot of them, and they may spread to other individuals quite readily. So with those kinds of infectious individuals, they must be isolated, um, which is our third eye. Right. They must be isolated so they cannot spread infection to others. What isolation typically means is they're put into a single hospital room with protected airflow, and any visitor to that hospital room wears a mask that filters out TB uh, organisms, uh, typically called an N95 mask. And then, of course, the person with active TB is treated for their infection. And usually in about two weeks, three weeks, or four weeks, they become non-infectious. That is, their anti-tuberculous therapy reduces the amount of TB organisms they have present, so they're not infectious anymore. So then they can come out of isolation um, and go back into their, their regular uh, home life. And is this treatment just going to be the same just using INH or that's a more intensive regimen? It's a more intensive regimen and we're going to have uh, a video or two about different treatment options. The other uh, thing to say about those with active TB in terms of the intensified case finding is when you find somebody with active TB, you must do contact evaluation as well. So you want to look to all the individuals that they have may have been in contact with before they were diagnosed because in doing so, you may discover other cases of active tuberculosis that also need to be managed with treatment, isolation, and so forth. So you're looking for their contacts, sort of evaluating. Exactly. You're looking for where they got the infection potentially or to whom they already spread the infection. So, so that's a very important uh, public health effort to reduce the continued spread of tuberculosis. The fourth and final I with TB prevention is immunization. Okay, that would be great. Why don't we just immunize everybody against TB and we won't have a problem. And that would be great if the vaccine were highly effective, which unfortunately, the current vaccine available worldwide has some effectiveness, but it's limited. That vaccine is called BCG, all capitals, and it's a live attenuated vaccine uh, derived from Mycobacterium bovis, which is another kind of tuberculous agent, uh, M. bovis. It's a vaccine which is administered in many parts of the world that have high rates of tuberculosis to try and prevent the spread, uh, try to prevent the individuals from acquiring TB and then spreading it. So the immunization is typically given around the time of birth with BCG. The degree of effectiveness of the vaccine varies widely from study to study, ranging from a low of 0% Ooh. to a high of about 80%. And most use the estimated protective effectiveness of about 50%. It turns out that the vaccine is especially effective, when it's effective, um, when given to children. That's why it's administered around the time of birth. Okay. And the reduction in TB is especially evident for those that, for severe disease. So it seems to reduce the likelihood of getting very severe disease, including TB meningitis and miliary TB. So that's important because that's the worst kind of tuberculosis. Uh, but again, its effectiveness is limited, as I've mentioned. Now, because this vaccine is live and attenuated, there are also some risks that you can get from vaccinating uh, a large number of individuals. So if you inadvertently vaccinate somebody who's got an immunodeficiency, their immune mm. system isn't working very well, their vaccin vaccine site can become quite necrotic and they can even disseminate the BCG. So you can have a, an infection arising from the vaccination. That's fortunately not way common, but it does occur. 
in just normal individuals, that is those who do not have any immunodeficiency, it's estimated that somewhere between one and 10% will get a little ulcer at the vaccine site. And you can see sort of this little uh, crater in their arm over a long term. And that sort of says, oh, this person's had BCG vaccine. And more, less commonly, uh, beyond the ulcer, you can get some local adenopathy, so lymph node swelling uh, around the area where the vaccine's been given, for example, in the armpit. And very rarely, maybe one in a, a million cases, you can get uh, osteomyelitis, a bone infection, from the BCG vaccine. These are all quite uncommon. Um, an on balance, BCG vaccine is more useful than not, and that's why it's given. And then the final thing I mentioned about immunization is there's a lot of interest and work in developing new vaccines for tuberculosis that would be more effective, of course, and with less side effects. And there are probably about 30 new vaccines under development, but unfortunately, at this point, none of them have uh, been found to be so beneficial as to be licensed for widespread use. But stay tuned, we hope to have a vaccine against tuberculosis that's more effective sometime in the future.